Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. A year ago, I began what will unfortunately be a regular series of these programs from now on. It's an annual look back on the musicians we lost in the previous years. Rockstar deaths have really been on our minds since late 2015, when Scott Weiland of the Stone Temple Pilots died, followed a few weeks later by Lemmy of Motorhead. Then the floodgates opened in 2016. Bowie, Prince, Leonard Cohen, Glenn Fry of the Eagles, both Keith Emerson and Greg Lake from Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and George Michael. That's just to name a few. Since then, it seems that we hear about a rock star death every couple of weeks. Tom Petty, Chris Cornell, Chester Bennington, Greg Allman, Walter Becker of Steely Dan, Chuck Mosley of Faith No More, Andy Fletcher of Depeche Mode, Mark E. Smith of The Fall, Charlie Watts of The Rolling Stones. It really has been a lot to take in. Some of these deaths have been of natural causes, disease, old age. Others have involved drugs, alcohol, years of hard living, misadventure, and suicide. Here is the hard truth. Rock has been around for about 70 years. Many of the people who have provided us with our favorite music and some of the greatest songs of all time are sadly reaching the end of their lives. No one's getting any younger. And over the next decade, we're going to lose some of the personalities who have always been there for us over the last 30, 40, 50, or even 60 plus years. With that grim reality in mind, I think we need to continue with an annual retrospective featuring those who we lost in the last 12 months. They may be gone, but we need to recognize and celebrate their contributions to the world of music. This is 2023 In Memoriam. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the annual look back on the musicians we lost over the last year. It's an odd feeling when we hear that one of our favorite musicians has died. It's not like we knew them personally, but there's still a personal connection. We use music to help us get through life. We use it to motivate, cheer us up, deal with sadness, express our love, get out our aggression, and so much more. We use it to figure out who we are. And this is important. We also use music to demonstrate who we are to the rest of the world. Music is a big part of our identity. And when a person who provided those songs, songs that help shape us internally and externally for a big chunk of our lives, when one of those people die, it feels like a little bit of us goes with them. We never knew them, you know, personally, but they helped us know ourselves. Again, that may seem a little dramatic to some people, but if you have found yourself unexpectedly affected by the death of a musician, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 2023 was another rough year, as many left us. I can't possibly get to all of them, so forgive me if I don't mention one of your favorites. But I do want to highlight a few notable departures. And we're going to start with Steve Harwell, the frontman of Smash Mouth. They became something of a punchline and were disparaged by some people in a nickelback sort of way. But the truth is that Smash Mouth was a huge cross-genre success in the early 2000s. Steve struggled with alcoholism for most of his adult life something that got worse after his son Presley died at the age of six months from leukemia. He drank so much that his liver began to fail. Things began to go even more poorly for Steve in 2013, when he received a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, a disease of the heart muscle. He was often out of breath, he was often dizzy, and he had an irregular heartbeat. In 2015, he was found to suffer from a condition known as acute Wernicke encephalopathy. Symptoms include problems with balance and movement, plus confusion and damaged eyesight. In 2021, his health made it impossible to continue with Smash Mouth. The band released this statement following a gig where Steve behaved strangely. Steve has been dealing with long-term medical issues over the last eight years, and during his last performance at the Big Sip Beer and Wine Festival at Bethel Wood Center for the Arts in New York, he suffered numerous symptoms directly linked with his current medical situation. As of today, Steve will be retiring from Smash Mouth, to focus on his physical and mental health. But the truth was, nothing could be done for Steve. In August, he started receiving hospice care at his home in Boise, Idaho. Then he passed away on September 4th at the age of 56.
Anyone who has seen Pulp Fiction will remember the scene when John Travolta goes back to Uma Thurman's place after the dance contest. She wants more music, so she flicks on a reel-to-reel player and starts playing a cover of a 1967 Neil Diamond song called Girl, You'll Be a Woman Soon. The band playing that cover was Urge Overkill, and the drummer was a guy named John Rowan, who went by the name Blackie Onassis. He and the band were from Chicago and became a serious cult favorite among the alt-rock crowd until they broke through with their contribution to the Pulp Fiction soundtrack. He was also with the group when they opened for Nirvana on their Nevermind tour. During this time, Urge Overkill became friends with Kurt and Chrissy Hind of the Pretenders and Liz Fair. But when Blackie left the group in 1996, the band lost track of him. They reformed in the early 2000s, but they did it without Blackie. We also know that he had issues with heroin in the middle 1990s and was arrested at least once. He was also rumored to be a smack connection for people who needed a fix. But as for the cause of his death on June 13th, 2023, we have no idea. He was 57. Baby, how can I now it's up to you. Here's a throwback to the technopop of the 1980s. The Associates were formed in Dundee, Scotland in 1979, evolving out of a couple of different post-punk bands and determined to follow a Bowie-like direction. The two principals in the Associates were Billy McKenzie and Alan Rankin. Rankin initially had his eyes set on being a professional tennis player, and although he was very good and competed at a high level, at 5'8", he was just too short to play against bigger, stronger players. So, music it was. The Associates released a series of synthy albums and singles. Rankin also got into production, working with groups like the Cocteau Twins. When the Associates broke up, he became a lecturer at Stowe College in Glasgow, where he helped students learn the finer points of music production. He even helped them set up a record label called Electric Honey, and that label launched the careers of bands like Snow Patrol, Bell and Sebastian, and Biffy Clyro. In the 2020s, Rankin was diagnosed with heart disease. He died at his home with his family on January 2nd, 2023. He was 64. Here's a 12-inch from my vinyl collection featuring the associates. This is from 1985, and it's called Take Me to the Girl. She drove me far too far And then I drove her far The streets were long and wide I felt I had no place to My courage When the world swiveled into alternative music in the early 1990s, it seemed that each day brought a new and interesting sound from a new and interesting group. Luscious Jackson was one of those groups. Their sound was a mix of alt-rock, rap, and pop. Vivian Trimble was their keyboardist. And because of another member's previous association with the Beastie Boys, drummer Kate Schellenbach was actually a member of the Beasties in the early days before producer Rick Rubin eased her out. Luscious Jackson not only toured with the Beasties, but also became the first signing to the Beasties' Grand Royal record label. Vivian left the group in 1998 because she was tired of touring and wanted to settle down with a family. She got married, had a couple of kids, moved to New Hampshire, and worked as a booker for a music venue. At some point, she was diagnosed with cancer. She managed for several years, but in early 2023, a complication developed, and she soon died on April the 4th. She was 59. The most successful Luscious Jackson album was a 1996 release entitled Fever In, Fever Out, selling somewhere beyond 500,000 copies. This song, which is called Naked Eye, was a significant alt-rock radio hit back then. More of our In Memoriam retrospective of 2023 coming up. This is the annual In Memoriam episode where we look back on the musicians we lost in the past 12 months. Here are a few more. Jeff Beck, believed by some to be the greatest electric guitarist of all time, died suddenly of bacterial meningitis on January 10th. He was 78. On March 13th, the tragic story of Jim Gordon came to an end. Back in the 1960s, He was an in-demand session musician playing on dozens of records. Then he joined Eric Clapton in Derek and the Dominoes. That's Jim playing on the classic Layla. But then Jim developed a severe case of schizophrenia. 
Voices told him that he needed to starve himself, forget playing drums. He couldn't sleep. He was diagnosed as an alcoholic and given the wrong treatment. Things got worse and worse and worse, until on June 3, 1983, a voice told him to attack his mother with a hammer and stab her to death with a butcher knife. So he did. He was sentenced to jail and denied parole at least 10 times, but his mental illness was so severe that he remained incarcerated at a psychiatric prison until he died of natural causes at age 77 on March 13th. Tina Turner, one of the greatest female singers of all time, died on May 24th at her home in Switzerland. She'd been ill for years with kidney issues, cardiovascular problems, and intestinal cancer. She was 83 when she died on May the 24th. Randy Meisner, a member of the Eagles in the early and mid-70s, suffered heart issues, alcoholism, and mental health problems. Things got worse when his wife accidentally shot herself in 2016. Meisner needed psychiatric care after that. He died of COPD on July 25th at the age of 77. Gary Wright, famous for the 1976 hit Dreamweaver and a synth pioneer admired by George Harrison and Ringo Starr, suffered from Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. He died at age 80 on August the 30th. Let's back up to January 28th when we lost Tom Verlaine. Tom was a member of Television, an artsy pre-punk group from New York, who was not only very good, but are responsible for establishing the entire punk rock scene at CBGB. In 1973, he helped Hilly Crystal, the owner of that scuzzy bar in Bleecker Street, in a then-horrible part of New York, to let television play on a Sunday night as part of a residency. That was the catalyst for making CBGB ground zero for the world of New York punk. And we all know how that turned out. Television started with two critically acclaimed albums, with Verlaine playing guitar before they broke up in 1978. Verlaine then worked solo, collaborated with contemporaries like Patti Smith, did some work with James Eha, The Smashing Pumpkins, had a song covered by David Bowie, toured occasionally with a reform television, and was part of a reunion album in 1992. He was also scheduled to produce Jeff Buckley's second album, but then Jeff drowned in the Mississippi River in 1997. Sometime in the 2000s, Verlaine was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Towards the end, he was supposed to tour with Billy Idol, but he was just too sick. The cancer metastasized, and he died on January 28th at the age of 73. Here's a sample of Verlaine's playing from Marquee Moon, the first television album from 1977. It's the title track. <laughs> Some really legendary names disappeared from the earth in 2023. Burt Bacharach, widely considered one of the greatest American songwriters and admired by people like Noel Gallagher, made it to 94 before dying on February the 8th. Gordon Lightfoot, the most successful singer-songwriter Canada ever produced, died on May 1st. He'd had health problems for years, almost dying of an aortic aneurysm in 2002, and then he had a minor stroke in 2006. But each time he fought back and continued to tour. His body finally gave out on May the 1st. He was 84. And we have to mention Tony Bennett, a guy whose career began in 1936 and continued until 2021. He died on July 21st at the age of 96. Meanwhile, Britpop fans were shocked to learn of the death of pulp bass player Steve Mackey. He joined the band in 1989 and was with him through the glory years of the 1990s before leaving in about 2002. That's when he started working as a producer and remix artist. His resume featured Corner Shop, The Kills, The Horrors, and he was a co-producer of Lungs, the debut album of Florence and the Machine. There were other jobs, too. He worked as a music director and sound designer for things like museums and films. Those were jobs that took him to the Louvre in Paris, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Minsheng Art Museum in Shanghai. And if you're a Harry Potter fan... You might know that Steve appeared as one of the Weird Sisters in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. That group also featured Jarvis Cocker of Pulp, plus Johnny Greenwood and Phil Selway of Radiohead. Steve did a lot of other music-related things, too. But one project he didn't want to take part in was a Pulp reunion in early 2023. In retrospect, that's probably because he was ill. When his death was announced on March 2nd at the age of 56, he'd been in the hospital since the previous Christmas with an undisclosed illness. Here's Steve with Pulp from 1994. 
Here are a few more notable passings from 2023. Randy Bachman, he of the Guess Who and Bachman Turner Overdrive, is just fine, but he lost two brothers. His youngest brother, Robbie, the original drummer for BTO, who died on January the 12th. And then Tim, a founding member of BTO, passed away of cancer on April the 28th. David Lindley was a well-respected guitarist who was hired by everyone from Jackson Brown and Warren Zevon to Curtis Mayfield and Dolly Parton. He may have been a victim of COVID. He got it in 2020, which developed into long COVID, and that resulted in chronic kidney damage. He died on March 3rd at the age of 78. Gary Rosington was one of the guys who put together Leonard Skinner, whose history goes back to 1964. He was also one of the survivors of the 1977 plane crash that nearly wiped out the band. Rosington had heart issues, and he died on March 5th at the age of 71. And then there's Van Connor. Van was the bassist with Screaming Trees, a very good but criminally overlooked part of the Seattle scene in the early 90s. He was with them for seven albums before they broke up, and then Van went on to work as a session musician. But then in December 2021, he underwent stomach surgery. There were complications, and he became comatose. While in the hospital, he caught COVID, which made things much worse. And for the rest of his life, he had respiratory issues and a hard time getting around. The final battle came with a case of pneumonia, and he died on January the 17th. Here are the Screaming Trees from their 1992 album, Sweet Oblivion. This song was an alt-rock radio hit. Back with more on our list of musicians who passed away in 2023 in just a sec. Here are more names from the 2023 In Memoriam file. Barrett Strong, the songwriter responsible for songs like Money, That's What I Want, I Heard It Through the Grapevine, Papa Was a Rolling Stone, and so many others, died on January 28th at 81. He was one of Motown's best writers. Wayne Swinney was the guitarist for Saliva, a solid post-grunge band out of Memphis, who had carved out a nice niche for themselves despite all kinds of lineup changes. When he died of a brain hemorrhage on March the 22nd, he was somewhere in Pennsylvania while the band was on tour. He was the only original member left. He was 59. Teresa Taylor, the real name of Teresa Nervosa, a one-time drummer with the Butthole Surfers, had a number of struggles. There was a brain aneurysm in 1989 that required surgery. And after that, she suffered seizures whenever she was exposed to strobe light effects. Still, she got into acting and writing and working at the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. When the Butthole Surfers got back together in 2007, she was part of the reunion. But then in 2021, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. She hung on until June 18th when she died at the age of 60. Speaking of drummers, Gary Young was with Pavement at the very beginning. He joined up in 1989. If you went to a pavement show back in the 90s, you might have encountered Gary at the door greeting people and handing out heads of cabbage, which was his thing. Gary was fired from the band in 1993. Alcohol was a problem, but he rejoined the band in 2010. Gary died on August the 17th at the age of 70. And then there's bass player Andy Rourke, one of the founding members of the Smiths with Morrissey, Johnny Marr, and Mike Joyce. Ask any Smiths fan, and they'll tell you that he was one of the greatest bassists in the history of British indie rock. His time with the Smiths did not end well. He had a heroin addiction, had to sue Morrissey and Marr for back royalties because he was broke, and about a decade later, had to declare bankruptcy over tax issues. He did, however, continue to work. He got jobs with The Pretenders, Killing Joke, and Stone Roses singer Ian Brown. He worked with Dolores O'Riordan of the Cranberries, Peter Hook of New Order, and weirdly, he also played on two Morrissey singles, despite all the hard feelings over money. Plus, there was at least one gig involving Johnny Marr. Cancer ran in his family. Both his father and his sister were diagnosed, which prompted Rourke to start up a cancer charity. But then, sometime in the early 2020s, he himself was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He died in a New York hospital on May the 18th at the age of 59. Here's Rourke showing his melodic bass playing style on the Smiths this charming man. I would go out tonight, but I haven't got a stitch to wear. This man said it's gruesome that someone so handsome should care. 
So many famous musicians passed in 2023. We're running out of time. So here, here's a list. David Crosby, he'd battled so many health issues that it became tough to keep count. Problems with alcohol, drugs, hepatitis C, other liver disease, a liver transplant, heart issues. And then on January the 23rd, he died of complications relating to COVID. He was 81. Sisto Rodriguez, the Detroit musician who was the subject of the film Searching for Sugar Man, a documentary that won an Academy Award in 2012, died. No one knew who he was in North America, at least not very many people, but in parts of Africa, his records were like gold. He died on August 8th at the age of 81. Robbie Robertson, a founding member of the legendary The Band, he was their guitarist and musical director and chief songwriter. It's interesting how a Canadian band helped create a whole new genre of music called Americana. He was also a frequent musical collaborator with Martin Scorsese in some of his best-known films. He suffered from prostate cancer, and he died at the age of 80 on August the 9th. Jimmy Buffett. He died of a rare and aggressive form of skin cancer on September 1st. He was 76. Steve Riley, who played in bands like Wasp, L.A. Guns, and Steppenwolf. Pneumonia. Mars Williams, a saxophonist who played for the Psychedelic Furs. Cancer. Jordy Walker of Killing Joke. He had a stroke and died on November 26th. The great Shane McGowan of the Pogues. He'd been ill for a very long time and finally succumbed to pneumonia and encephalitis on November the 30th. Miles Goodwin, the leader of April Wine, suddenly left us on December 3rd. He'd been dealing with diabetes. Denny Lane, an important part of Paul McCartney and Wings, lung disease, December 5th. And finally, Sinead O'Connor. Sinead led a troubled life from the beginning with both physical and mental health struggles. But during her career, she became an icon as someone who refused to bend and insisted on doing everything, and I mean everything, her way. And her first two albums are Stone Cold Classics. There were several suicide attempts along the way. People were concerned for her well-being and any kind of self-harm she may engage in. In the end, she was found unresponsive in her London apartment on July the 26th and was declared dead on the scene. In early January 2024, the coroner's report came down. Sinead died of natural causes. Nothing suspicious. The case is now closed. Still not done. Here are a few more we lost in 2023. Lisa Marie Presley, daughter of Elvis. Nick Lloyd Webber, son of Andrew. Spot, the producer known for producing hardcore records for Black Flag and The Descendants. Seymour Stein, the founder of Sire Records and the guy who not only brought tons of English bands to North America, like The Pretenders and The English Beat and The Smiths and more, but also the person who discovered and signed Madonna to her first deal. Harry Belafonte, the singer and activist. John Gosling, keyboardist with The Kinks. There's got to be more, and I know I miss people, but every year this list gets longer and longer and longer. Rest in power, everyone. 2024 will inevitably bring more sad news. And I hate to be that guy, but with so many of our musical heroes in their 70s and 80s, things are going to accelerate. You know that when sites like Wikipedia and Billboard keep running lists of these things, you know that we're in for a rough time. There are plenty more shows like this available as podcasts or any podcast platform. Most of them deal with much happier things than this show. I can be found on Facebook, X, Threads, Instagram, all the social media channels. Email should go to alan at alancross.ca. And don't forget to check out my website, a journal of musical things.com. It's updated with music news and information every single day, and you should get the free newsletter, so don't miss a thing. And one more thing. There's my other podcast called Uncharted, Crime and Mayhem in the Music Industry. It is a true crime and music podcast that I think you'll really, really like. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross.